All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, bringing you all the best news of the week. And uh, yeah, today we got actually quite a few very interesting and exciting news, along with some uh, not exactly JavaScript related things that are a bit terrifying, like zombie load, if you've heard about it already. But uh, before we get to that, let's get started. The first section, as usual, is getting started with all the articles you need to get started with a JavaScript development or specific libraries. The first article here today is the string matching regex explained step by step. This is a pretty nice tutorial that guides you through creating a regular expression that would parse JSON. While it is a good exercise, I would not recommend parsing JSON using regular expressions because it's not very reliable. Uh, using a proper grammar parser is way better approach. But nonetheless, this is a very good introduction uh, blah, introduction to regular expressions. Um, but it does assume that you know at least the basics of how the regex works. So it's not the very, very basic introduction. Uh, keep that in mind. Next article we got here is building live streaming service app with Node.js and React. If you ever wanted to build your own Twitch clone or you know live streaming service, essentially, this uh, tutorial has everything you need to get started. It uses RTMP server in Node.js and then a basic React UI for d distributing the live streams across the viewers. It's quite detailed and quite nicely written. So if you're curious, do check it out. Hey Tim, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got Next.js authentication tutorial. This is a pretty basic tutorial on how to create or I guess add authentication using passport to your Next.js app with a custom um, Express.js server. So this is a very specific setup here. Uh, if you already know how to do that, then you won't really find anything new here. If you are still struggling to figure out how to connect Next.js with Express and add authentication on top, this article has you covered. Next article we got here is how to build a router with vanilla JavaScript. Uh, again, a very basic introduction on building your own custom router with vanilla JS without using anything else. This is talking about the browser router specifically, if I remember correctly, let me just clarify that here. Um, yes, so this is talking specifically about browser router. So this one work in Node.js, but it does give a very good introduction to, you know, how exactly you build a router within a browser in just a few lines, honestly. Uh, hey, Aya, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got automating TurboTax data entry with Puppeteer. I guess people hate taxes so much they want to out to fill them, which actually makes perfect sense. And, um, you know, as much as the tax doesn't really have much to do with this article itself, it's a really good tutorial on how to use Puppeteer to automatically fill data on different websites, including the authentication, you know, logging in, waiting for specific form fields and stuff like this. So if you never use Puppeteer, it's actually a good starting point. Or if you wanted to have a more complex use case where you read data from files and fill it into the website, this uh, gives you a pretty good impression on how to do that. All right, next article we got here is WebSockets tutorial, how to go real time with Node and React, a pretty basic tutorial on using Node and React uh, and connecting them via WebSockets to pass the data between the clients in real time. Nothing really super complicated here, but if you are still confused about WebSockets and how to use them, do check it out. Um, which, uh, Aya, what are you asking about the React? Uh, you should be a bit more specific when you ask questions in chat because I have a delay between, or I guess you have a delay between me talking and the actual stream. So it would be nice if you just clarify a bit more. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, we got uh, how to debug memory leaks in Node.js application on Heroku. This is a Heroku specific article, but if you are hosting there and if you are maybe having some issues with Node.js and was wondering how exactly can you debug that, this article has you covered. So basically everything you need to know about debugging on Heroku and yeah, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, Rotor, uh, yes, you can use it with React, why not? Sure, but it's not React specific, so we'd have to basically craft the React bit around it by yourself. It is just a basic vanilla router that just does something on root change essentially, it's very simple. All right, next article we got here is how to scroll to item in React. A very basic article that demonstrates how to scroll the item in view in React. Again, you know, it's very good for people who are just starting out with React if you've already been working with it and know what create read, uh, bleh. Let me try that again. Create ref is then you won't really find anything new here. It is very straightforward. 
Next article we got here is building a React timer component using hooks. A pretty nice introduction to React hooks using the timer component that I, I think have been used in just about any other tutorial about hooks, to be honest. It's a very good, you know, it's a very good component to be an example. So if you're still getting uh, into React with hooks and you are confused about them uh, to some degree and wanted to get started on something simple, then this article is for you. If you already know how hooks work, you won't really find anything new here. Next article we got here is developing our first progressive web app using React. Uh, this is a starter tutorial uh, that demonstrates how to develop a progressive web app using create react app. So starting from the very basics, and then going all the way to installing the app uh, from the browser and you know, running it on your mobile phone and so on and so forth. Um, the caveat here is that as you might know or might not know, the progressive web apps actually require you to work over HTTPS. So you need an SSL certificate for this. And in this case, the author just says, okay, we're gonna use ngrok to forward port from the local host to ngrok's subdomain and that's it. ngrok just handles the uh, HTTPS for you. So this is just bear in mind. Otherwise, it's a pretty good article. And if you wanted to get into the um, PVAs with React, then do check this one out. All right, continuing, we got getting started with Swell 3. This is a pretty good tutorial on Swell 3. Um, again, it's a bit more extended, a bit more detailed than the official one. But uh, yeah, if you wanted to try it out, then do check this one out. It has basically everything you need to know to get started. Two-way bindings, production building, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's very straightforward. But I mean, Swell 3 is really nice. And I do want to make a stream about it at some point, probably next week, but we'll see how that goes. All right, continuing, we got JavaScript engines. How do they even work? From call stack to promise, almost everything you need to know. This is indeed almost everything you need to know about JavaScript engines. Uh, this is sort of a high level overview, so it doesn't go into a lot of details on how exactly the parts of the engine work, but it is really cool. So if you still don't know how the JavaScript engine works, even on a high level, this is a very good article to get started. And we also give you some pointers to you know go deeper essentially. So do check this one out. All right, um, I think that was it. No, that was not actually it. So we got two more articles for getting started. The uh, next one is Advanced Blog System and Gatsby. So this talks about setting up your own blog in Gatsby with pagination categories, feature posts, author, CEO, and navigation with basically step-by-step -step guides on how to do that, how to what plugins to use and so on and so forth. So if you were thinking of rolling your own blog and um, doing it with Gatsby, then this article got you covered basically. It's actually very detailed and very nice. Amusingly enough, it's actually published on Medium, so there you go. <laughs> but yes, if you wanted your blog in Gatsby, you can do it right now by just following this 10-minute um, article, I guess. All right, and the last thing we got here in getting started section is a new course on GraphQL from Hasura guys, which uh, is actually quite good. So if you wanted to get into GraphQL, this I think this takes about two hours to go through uh, overall. And it explains everything you got to know about GraphQL and everything you need to know to work with GraphQL in uh, specifically React apps, I believe. Uh, now, if you haven't heard about Hasura, I would actually recommend getting a look because it's a really cool engine that allows you to set up GraphQL over, uh, for example, I think it was over Postgres. I don't know if they support other backends, whoops. But setting up uh, the GraphQL over the Postgres with existing knowledge base takes milliseconds. It's like you just literally press two buttons and you're done. It's, it's really awesome. So do check it out. All right, now we're coming to the article section uh, with more interesting and more in-depth, more advanced articles. Let's put it this way. And the first one we got here is discovering patterns with React hooks from uh, ponyfoo.com blog, which typically has a very high quality stuff. And this article talks about um, exactly, you know, discovering hooks patterns in a manner that, okay, so we have this exhibits as in use cases, for example, feature toggles, and how exactly do we implement it using React hooks, right? So in this, a bunch of cases covered here, including, uh, again, feature toggles, toast notifications, and user guides. And uh, then the yeah, this is just basically walk through on how exactly hooks help you do uh, achieve those goals. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. This does assume the basic knowledge of React hooks. So if you are just getting started, it won't be very helpful to you. All right, 
Next article we got here is web workers in real world. Um, an article that talks about applying web workers in real world, as you might guess. Um, first of all, it talks about what the web workers are, how do they work and why are they helpful? And then it goes a bit deeper at what kind of caveats can you have when you're working with them? How do you use Comlink library that simplifies working with them? And again, what kind of caveats do you have when working with a Comlink? It's a really well written article and there's a lot of very interesting information here. So if you're um, basically just starting out with the web workers, it's actually a really good one to start. Or if you've been working with the web workers for quite some time, but wanted to simplify them and never heard about Comlink, this article is also worth reading because Comlink is actually amazing. So if you never heard about it, definitely check this one out. All right. Continuing, we got making the move from jQuery to Vue.js. This is for all you people there still working with jQuery and uh, you know considering new frameworks and thinking, okay, maybe we should migrate or maybe your company decided that it's time, it's finally time to migrate to Vue.js or something more modern. And uh, now you have to learn it. So this article actually gives a very good comparison and draws pretty nice parallels between jQuery and Vue.js. So if you want it, or if you are in the process of moving, do check this one out. It actually will give you some pretty good pointers on how to do that in a least painful way. Let's just put it this way. All right, next thing we got here is TypeScript 3.0, the unknown type. A pretty good introduction to the new unknown type, which is a type safe counterpart of any type in the TypeScript 3.0 and later, obviously. So if you're working with TypeScript and you never heard about it or you heard about it but wasn't sure what exactly it does, this is a very good article that explains exactly what you need to know about it to apply it in real life. So if you're using TypeScript, do check it out. It is quite good. Even, you know, I, as a person who doesn't really use TypeScript that much, I was able to grasp the concept of unknown uh, quite quickly with this one. All right, next article we got here is functional-ish JavaScript. Um, just like the... <laughs> The article talks about applying functional programming principles in JavaScript, but only to extend that helps you. This is, uh, I now know the term that would perfectly describe the way I write f JavaScript. You know, it's like functional-ish JavaScript because I rely on functional programming a lot, but I don't lock myself into it because there are some cases when object-oriented programming actually makes sense and there's no reason to just go functional for the sake of being functional. I think this is one of the strengths of JavaScript that you can mix and match those two. And this article talks exactly about this. So it talks about, hey, you can actually be functional majority of time. And this is what you need to do to achieve that. Like, you know, state encapsulation, memoizing stuff, uh, bubbling exceptions, and using promises and sync await over callbacks, uh, using classes if they fit. Again, this is the bit of functional-ish. Uh, and then, you know, preferring immutability over mutability and stuff like this, it is quite good. So, you know, if you're still struggling to understand why functional programming might help you, then this one is quite, quite nice. Uh, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is a practical guide to JavaScript proxy. So this is obviously talking about the ES6 proxy uh, primitive that's been added to the, no, it's not primitive, right? It's, it's the proxy utility class. I'm, I guess, I guess it's a class, right? So basically, yes, ES6 proxy, it's, it allows you to do meta programming and this article introduces you to proxy and gives you a bunch of use cases that uh, show off how exactly to use proxy to, for example, provide default values or override function calls or give array and negative indices or there's a bunch of other options uh, or things you can do with that. So if you wanted to get into proxies, but was kind of terrified of it, as I was in the very beginning, then do check this one out. It actually does a decent job at explaining what it is and how do you can apply it in a very practical manner. So that's quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is actually a four part article on Node.js monitoring in production, which is pretty nice. So that's the sort of introduction of what kind of metrics do you want to monitor in typical Node.js setup. The second article talks about the existing open source monitoring tools and the, obviously there are advantages, disadvantages and so on and so forth. Yeah, let me try that again. Advantages, disadvantages and so on and so forth. And the third part talks about the simplifying of the monitoring and the last part actually um, promotes the Node.js monitoring in production ebook. So if you are interested, do check it out. It is, you know, the first three parts at least is a very, very good write up and maybe you would be interested in the book as well. So. Yeah. All right. 
Continuing, I think this is actually the last article we got in the section. Uh, this is a description or I guess more detailed description of a new proposal uh, for binary AST uh, in JavaScript that would allow for faster script loading. So the article is called faster script loading with binary AST question mark. I'm also terrible at pronouncing questions apparently. And um, yeah, this is a proposal that has been introduced by I believe four major players. Uh, yeah, there we go. So it's it's being worked on on by engineers from Mozilla, Facebook, Bloomberg and Cloudflare, which is Actually, I think this is the first time I see Bloomberg working on JavaScript, but um, whatever. So the idea is quite simple. The idea is that, uh, you know, the way the JavaScript parsing works is that we take the actual JavaScript, we compile it to AST, and then this AST is interpreted by the engine, right? Or executed by the engine, actually. And the core idea of binary AST proposal is that the JavaScript source could be parsed into binary AST by the server and then this binary AST can be streamed to the browser. So the browser instead of taking time to parse it could actually just compile it and execute it, right? And uh, there's some, you know, even the preliminary results that show uh, there's like a bunch of more technical details if you're interested. But even the preliminary results that they have over here in the article show quite a significant improvement in the loading speeds and the time to interaction on the page with, um, you know, with, even with existing frameworks without any specific changes to account for binary AST, which I imagine would definitely happen once this is released. So there's like up to 13% of speed increase in average parse time with binary AST, which is just insane. And this is for a relatively small, actually, source code. So 70, 72 kilobytes, which is kind of awesome. So yeah, it is um, it's very interesting. So if you are interested in this sort of, you know, engine level things, then do definitely check the article out. It has a very good write up on how exactly this thing works under the hood, what exactly happens, why is it important? And there's a, like a bunch of benchmarks and test results here, which is also kind of cool. So if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. All right, now we come to the um, tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. The first thing we got here today is the short write up that shows you how to extract text from an image using the shape detection API that is, I believe it's only in Chrome for now and it's also behind the flag. So you have to manually enable that. But once this is shipped, you basically will be able to use JavaScript and you know, you progressive web apps or whatever to take a photo or a screenshot or whatever, and then use a very simple API that is literally like 20 lines of code to extract the text out of this photo or image or whatever. Which I'm, um, I mean, considering, you know, if you look at the image quality here in the post, it's, it's not a very good camera, right? There's a lot of like artifacts and there's like the screen doesn't look very good, but the API still manages to extract majority of text pretty precisely. So this is, quite damn impressive. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is faster, smarter JavaScript debugging in Firefox DevTools, an article that talks about the improvements for Firefox DevTools that has been done over the past time and is gonna come in the near future to the DevTools. So if you're using Firefox or if you're not using Firefox, but we're considering it, do check it out. There's some pretty exciting things in here. Um, the next thing we got here is the Lean Core update from the React Native team. Um, in the past couple of months, they removed 12 public APIs or polyfills from React Native and 14 more are scheduled for removal. And if you never heard about the Lean Core initiative, so the core idea is that the current version of React Native has too much stuff inside of it in, as a part of the core. So it's a bit heavy, right? When you compile it to the final app, there's going to be a lot of stuff and you might not even use that. The idea of Lean Core is to take all of that stuff that is kind of optional and not required and just move it out into third party packages, which makes perfect sense. And, you know, there's like completed work, there's more than a half already done and uh, yeah, more to come. So in the end, we should have a pretty lean React Native. If And if you don't need any third party libraries, you should be able to just do that, right? Install a simple, tiny React Native and use it, uh, which is kind of nice. All right, so next thing we got here is experimental WebAssembly module support landed in Node.js. Yes, you heard that right. You can actually now, uh, it's still behind the flag, so it's experimental again, but once you put, um, add these flags to Node.js, you can actually import WebAssembly files 
as modules directly. So here's an example here, uh, you can just literally use import statement and then do from module.vasm and it will import it automatically and expose the, the native functions to you essentially, right? The WebAssembly functions, which is kind of awesome. So I, you know, if you ever tried to work with WebAssembly modules in Node.js, you knew it was a bit of a pain in the ass because there's like a bunch of additional code involved. And having this implemented is a lot nicer. So yes, this is definitely exciting. And I think it's gonna be a big boon for the libraries because essentially you would be able to just build the library in WebAssembly and then publish it with simply this statement, right? I'm not sure if that would, I'm kind of curious if, if the uh, importer would pick it up, if you would point the main from the package JSON to module.vasm, would that work? If that would work, then you don't even need any JavaScript to publish WebAssembly modules, which is again, kind of awesome. So there you go. All right, uh, and the I think that's the last thing we got here for today is the future of React Router and Reach Router. So there's a bit more details in the post, but the TLDR of it is that the React Router and Reach Router are gonna be merging together. The React Router will be the surviving project. It's gonna be a new hook-based API and is gonna be introduced as a minor release of React Router, 100% backwards compatible and if you are using Reach Router, it's still going to be supported for quite some time with like bug fixes and stuff, but no more updates basically, which is kind of nice because uh, yeah, it's, it's better to have one big community maintained router than 25 different alternatives that are kind of the same-ish. So I think it makes perfect sense to do that, considering those two were the biggest ones. And uh, I definitely like the Reach Router API more, but I did like that the community again uh, around React Router was sort of more involved, let's put it this way, or bigger, I guess. So yes, quite quite interesting to see that. All right, now we are coming to the releases section. The first major release of this week is V8 version 7.5 that is now includes a bunch of WebAssembly improvements, specifically implicit caching and bulk memory operations. And it also includes the numeric separators in JavaScript. So you can now write very long numbers using underscores uh, between the numbers to actually make it more human readable. So there you go. And there's obviously like 25 different performance improvements as usually it happens with V8, you know, it's like this, the people working on it are completely crazy with that part. <laughs> All right. Uh, next series we got here is ESLint version six alpha. Um, and it basically, for some reason, uh, so it fixes config loading bugs, but it is published as a breaking change. So I'm not sure what exactly is happening there. I guess it might change the behavior of ESLint in some projects. They also did quite a lot of changes to ESLint recommended. So if you're depending on that, make sure to check all of that. And the no redeclare has been made stricter. So again, make sure to check that if you're using the no redeclare rules. So since majority of the um, changes are basically related to the changes in the config loading due to bug fixes and the changes in the rules in ESLint recommended and no redeclare specifically. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Apollo React Hooks beta release. So if you're using Apollo, there's now a React Hooks package in beta available. Again, uh, probably not a good idea to use it in production, but if you wanna play around with it, you can now. There's a really nice thread that demonstrates how to use that and you can just uh, take it and try it right now. The API actually seems pretty neat. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. And the next thing we got here is Stencil 1 beta release. So I, th I don't remember if we actually talked about Stencil 1 or not. I think the, they announced the initial release on Polymer Summit in 2017 exactly. And since then it just kind of disappeared. So this is the build tool chain, I guess, from the Ionic uh, framework guys. And there are some interesting things. So for example, they use um, machine learning for bundling, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they use the algorithm inspired by word embeddings. It, it sounds kind of strange. I, I mean, again, I, you know, I'm not sure if there's actual machine learning happening in the bundling itself, but at least they use the algorithm that is inspired by machine learning technique which is at the very least kind of interesting. So it looks it looks kind of cool. I mean, it's like, yeah, so they produce the super tiny bundles and they allow you to work with any framework out there. Basically, this is how they, um, this is how they migrated the Ionic to work with all the other frameworks too. So because, you know, Ionic 4 works with Angular, React, Vue and Snow framework at all if you want to. 
And the same goes for Stencil, which seems interesting. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Maybe this is the tool you were looking for. Right, next thing we got here is TypeScript 3.5 release candidates uh, coming with a bunch of improvements. As you might imagine, this is a minor release, so nothing really uh, super interesting here, I believe. So just primarily improvements to speed and type checking speed ups and incremental improvements and so on and so forth. And uh, next release we got here is uh, April release of VS Code version 1.34 with um, again this bunch of improvements i think the major highlight would be the remote api making it into the stable build so if you ever wanted to try this remote plugin but didn't want to install insiders build now you can do that with a stable one i remember reading about that somewhere but it doesn't seem to be in the release notes anymore ah there we go there it is okay preview remote development yeah so it's still preview it's still considered not to be very stable but um, I know it still requires VS Code Insiders. That's interesting. Okay. Um, I, I expected that <laughs> since it was in the release notes, it would be shipped, but okay. I guess it still requires Insiders. All right, but uh, continuing. We got Atom version 1.37 with the major feature being the pull request review comments in a GitHub package. So you can now directly review the pull requests right in your Atom editor, which actually looks pretty sick. So, you know, if you're using Atom, that's quite exciting. Uh, they also claim dramatic fuzzy finder performance boost, which is also always very nice. And there's a bunch of other minor things changed. So, you know, make sure to update. It's always a good idea. All right, that is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. Uh, the first library we got here today is Ria Kit, uh, builds accessible reach web Ria, uh, blah, let me try let me try that again. Build accessible reach web apps with React. Uh, so it's a set of components that are um, completely accessible. So they actually follow WAI area button patterns and uh, all the other WAI uh, area guidelines for the accessibility, which is super cool. And there's basically majority of the components you might want to have are here. All of them are stylable and everything. And yeah, so if you care about accessibility, that's actually a really good, um, really good toolkit to get started with. And it's also tree shakeable, so you're gonna get very tiny bundles, which is super nice. Uh, and yeah, each each component has an average size of one kilobyte. So there you go. All right, next library we got here, or actually a demo is run package. Uh, so it's an extension to unpackage, which is unpackage.com that allows you to explore a package in sort of a file browser. So you can basically enter any package over here. You It will load the data from unpackage and you can actually explore all of the source code and all of the published codes directly in your browser, which is kind of neat. There's also like static analysis and everything here, which is kind of cool. So if you're working with Unpackage, then do check it out, it's very handy. All right, next thing we got here is Spoke by Mozilla, uh, 3D social scenes for hubs, again, another Mozilla project. Uh, so it's basically a 3D editor where you can create uh, things pretty easily actually, like literally takes, you know, drag and dropping stuff and then clicking and then embedding web content in it, for example. It's all made on WebGL and it's open source, which is, you know, kind of awesome as well. So if you're curious how it was made, you can just go to GitHub and check it out. If that sounds interesting, do check this one out. It's pretty cool. Uh, next thing we got here is stop runaway effects from Mr. Can't See Dots, a pretty neat uh, development time utility that overrides or hijacks effects in React that allows you to, uh, that basically warns you when you have the same effect hook or I think the second hook, what was it? Use layout effect. So we'll actually tap into those hooks. And if the same hook is executed more than once, it will actually show you a warning within the console saying, hey, you might have a problem over there. Uh, check it out. You know, if that's not, a, not intended, you probably should make sure that it actually doesn't execute second time, which is very handy because uh, Layout hooks and effect hooks can bring you some additional pain in the ass if you don't handle the redrawing correctly, basically. Right, next library we got here is sitemap.js, a sitemap generating framework for Node.js. Um, yeah, very straightforward sitemap generator. You just pass it some options and 
call it and then basically just draws a sitemap for you. It's <laughs> super simple. Uh, you can provide the sitemap yourself as well and just use it as a render for the sitemap uh, within your Express as the example show here. So if you are working with a, you know, SEO, I guess this is probably the uh, most, most important bit for the sitemaps. Do check this one out. It might be helpful for you. Next library we've got here is DynoQL, uh, customizable GraphQL style query language for interacting with JavaScript objects. So just as it says, the idea is that you can take any objects uh, in JavaScript and then run queries against it that kind of look like GraphQL. Um, and I guess that could be useful in some cases. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. It looks handy. I guess if you have a very complex data structure, that might be very helpful. All right. Continuing, we got mail go, a different mail to uh, more possibilities, less spam. So the idea is that instead when you click the email, instead of uh, actually having a mail to link, you will have a mail go link that shows a model window, allows you to pick a provider, which I guess those are hard coded, which seems a bit weird because not a lot of people use, I mean, I guess a lot of people use Gmail and Outlook, but this is not like the most popular options. So I guess making it configurable would be a bit more interesting. But then again, you know why, for example, since I use Gmail, I has Gmail configured as my default mail client. So I'm not sure why would I need three buttons there if I just want to open it. But nonetheless, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is React Virtuoso, an elegant virtual list component for React. So this is just as the title says, a virtual list that allows you to render very, very long lists. Uh, the Cool thing is that basically it automatically handles the variable uh, height items. If for some reason React Virtualized and React Window didn't work for you, check this one out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Next demo we got here is Use Anim Hook, a super small hook based uh, animation library for React. It is 2.7 kilobytes and the has a pretty nice API. So if you were looking into the Animating your React components in a simple way, do check this one out, seems to be quite cool. Um, then again, you know, there's like Spring and everything, and I believe they also have hook support now. So I'm not sure, maybe it's, you know, I guess Spring is a bit bigger than this one. So do check this one out. All right, continuing, we got Ola, Smooth Animation Library for interpolating numbers. So if you ever wanted to do number interpolation in a very nice way, Check this one out, it actually looks really slick. Um, again, you know, this is, the library itself is just for the number interpolation, so not the visualizations. But if you work with DataVis, then, well, it can come in handy quite a long time, quite a lot of times, so do check it out. All right, continuing, we've got React Type, a prototyping tool for exporting React and TypeScript applications. It's basically, I believe it's an Electron app that allows you to do sort of what you see is what you get thing and then export it as a React TypeScript app, which looks quite nice and it's open source. So that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is slow JSON stringify, the slowest stringifier in the known universe, just kidding, is the fastest. So if you ever need it, if you ever, for some reason, the JSON.stringify was too slow for you, um, then this, this library is here. It says it performs um, uh, 10,000 times faster than the native one. So yeah, if you wanted to stringify JSON really fast, then there you go. This is uh, an option for it. So, okay. Continuing, we got HOPS, Universal Development Environments. This is kind of like Next.js. So again, it's a React development environment, I believe, or I think it's, oh no, okay, it's, it's yes, it is React. Okay, there you go. It says universal, but it's actually just for React. But it basically does more or less the same things that Next.js does, server-side rendering, universal JavaScript, hot module reloading, JSX, uh, ES 2018, Babel, bundle splitting, whatever the hell you imagine. Not exactly sure what are the advantages of this over Next.js because again, you know, it's never mentioned in the readme, but uh, maybe you wanted something like this, so do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is auto, generate releases based on semantic version labels on pull requests. So the idea is quite straightforward. It's a CI tool that allows you to automatically generate releases just by using labels on your pull request within GitHub. So it's a specifically GitHub related tool. I don't believe it's gonna work anywhere else, but you know, the setup is straightforward. You just add it in your CI script and then you just add the label to your pull request and the tool will automatically figure out what kind of release do you want, automatically generate change log and do all the 
stuff that you typically have to do yourself. So if you are if you want to automate everything and use labels for it on GitHub, do check it out. It seems quite nice. Next thing we got here is I, <laughs> right. So I don't know how to read that. Uh, if I read it as me, it sounds like I'm sneezing in a terrible way, but uh, it's M-H-Y. I, <laughs> I don't know why you would call it like this. But there you go. It's M-H-I, a zero config out of the box, multipurpose toolbox and development environment. Uh, yes, another one of this. It's basically the idea is the same as, you know, of Next.js, for example, but this one is aimed to work with libraries. So it has the sort of everything set up for you you can call the webpack dev server you can call the babel build it for production you can run webpack to do production build or do stuff like this i guess it's like a key to simplify your build pro or development and build process um not sure i would use that because i don't know how fine-grained the control is but uh, if that sounds interesting do check it out maybe this is what you were looking for all right, next thing we got here is Glicky, an in-browser task runner for modern web development. This is basically a browser UI for your scripts that you can just run uh, by pressing buttons instead of typing npm run whatever or yarn run whatever. It seems okay. I like, you know, as a terminal junkie, I definitely wouldn't really use something like this myself, but maybe you prefer browser UIs more. So there you go. All right, continuing, we got XLS stream, uh, turn XLS X into a readable stream, a pretty neat library that allows you to um, convert the XLS X file into a stream and then run any transformations on it you want and then do something to that stream results. Um, so if you're working, if you ever worked with any really big files, you know that streams are essentially uh, essen essentially essential. That's a terrible way of putting it. But streams are essential to processing really big files in Node.js because you can really load all of that into memory. And well, this one seems to be working with XLSX files, which is kind of nice. So if you are working with them and wanted to work with the really big ones to check it out, it seems to be quite cool. Right, next thing we got here is Web Template Studio. This is a new extension from Microsoft uh, for the VS Code and it's um, it allows you to quickly build web applications using a wizard-based UI to turn your needs into a foundation of the best patterns and practices. What it really means is that essentially it's an extension for VS Code that uh, allows you to scaffold the projects in a very quick way. Um, one of the Things obviously to note, this is a Microsoft project. So as you might expect, there's like Microsoft Azure integration, which is actually quite, quite neat. So you don't have to use it obviously, but it is there and it allows you to scaffold projects for, well, just about any project you might ever want, like React, Create React App, Express, Express Generator, Bootstrap, Angular, Angular Cli, Vue, Vue Cli, or Node.js. And all of them follow best practices. They have a very nice uh, templates and everything. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It actually looks quite cool. All right, continuing, we got Tour Guide JS, a simple, lightweight, clean, and small library for creating guided product tours for your web app. Just exactly, it says, you know, it's it's a tour guide thing that your user sees the first time whenever he launches your website. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is HueJ, a Philips Hue client for Node.js. So if you have the Philips Hue um, bulbs and wanted to control them with Node.js, now you can. Actually, it looks quite established already. So yes, if you wanna uh, you wanna change the colors in your house using Node, now you can, I guess. And uh, yeah, looks looks very nice. So do check it out if you have Philips Hue. Right. Next thing we got here is React Hotkey Hook. Uh, this is um, React Hook for using keyboard shortcuts in components. It actually, looks pretty neat. So you essentially just use Hotkey's hook. And then as the first argument, you pass the hotkey that you want to trigger or a hotkey combination. And the second argument is the callback that should be executed whenever the hotkey is pressed. And all of that is local to the component, which makes it quite nice and localized. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems to be quite neat. All right, next demo we got here is React Share, social media share buttons and share counts for React. Just a ton of different buttons that you can add to share things. There is a lot of them. I guess they are here for like 99% of the most popular social platforms on, on the internet. So yeah, there's even some Russia specific ones. There you go. If you were looking at something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React Final Form, high performance subscription based form state management for React. 
It seems to be a very uh, form. Uh, how do you how do you put it? A very specific like it's a library for working with forms. Okay. I wanted to make a joke about this is not even my final form, but I couldn't come up with anything smart, so you have to do it yourself. But um, essentially, this is a library that allows you to uh, draw a form and then manage a state using render props, as you can see over here. Same goes for the fields inside of a form. Seems relatively straightforward. I believe the final form uh, library itself is quite established. Uh, so yeah, it's like already version four and there's quite a lot of stars and I believe it's quite a big community. It is relatively small, which is also nice. And uh, yeah, if you wanted to use it with React to check it out. And the last demo we got here today is page.js, a micro client side router inspired by Express router. So if you ever wanted to have a look at the, how do you write a tiny router that allows you to uh, do client side routing and it looks kind of like Express.js, do check this one out. She has pretty nice API and allows you to do things whenever the route changes. Yeah, it's it's very straightforward, right? So um, that's basically it for demos and libraries. So we got two more things to talk about before we wrap this up. Uh, those are non JavaScript related or actually, I guess kind of JavaScript related. So the first one is we got the new CPU hardware uh, attack. So there's we already had meltdown, we had spectre, we had foreshadow and uh, well, now we have zombie loads which yeah allows you to steal sensitive data and keys while the computer have access to them and it's actually terrifying so yeah more cpu bullshit uh, i don't know it, it feels like you know we can basically throw away our cpus right now until the next generation comes that is fundamentally changes the architecture because this is architectural flaw right and you can't really fix it with software i guess but uh, if you're interested, do check it out. There's a white paper. There's um, there's even an exploit that you can try yourself, obviously written in C and C++. And yeah, it, it works. It runs. You can actually extract whatever the hell you want from memory. It is terrifying. And uh, we're all doomed as usual. <laughs> On a positive note, we got infomesh.org. Uh, this is an information mesh website that was released to celebrate the 30 years of World Wide Web. And it uh, shows off how the World Wide Web changed in the last 30 years with some nice visualizations and some nice timelines. So for example, there's like a timeline of introduction of uh, new browsers to the World Wide Web, starting from the very base browser, going to links, going to the Internet Explorer, going to Netscape Navigator and whatever the hell you imagine. Everything is here. It's kind of cool. There's also a pretty nice visualization in the background. For some reason, if you scroll really fast, it starts lagging. So I guess they didn't account for people clicking really fast, but there you go. Uh, there's also a really cool map of, uh, you know, people having access to the internet, which is quite interesting to scroll through as well. Um, there is one caveat with this map. For some reason, somebody decided it was a nice idea to select the same color for the C as one of the colors for the um, population which at one point makes map blend, which just looks a bit weird, but nonetheless, it's a really cool visualization. So if you were curious about web development or I guess development of the web, because this is a better way of putting it, is there's nothing to do with software development here. It's more of about the World Wide Web as a thing, right? And if you were curious how it changed over the past 30 years, then definitely check it out. There's some really cool information here, some really cool visualizations and some really interesting things to read about. So yeah, that is actually it from my side, guys. So this was BXS Weekly episode 63. As usual, you can find all the links that I've mentioned on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Um, there is a Telegram channel where I post all unfiltered links that typically, like some part of them don't really make it to the podcast. But if you want to see all the stuff that I gather, you can just read it. We also have the Discord server where the links are cross posted. And we also just sit there and discuss shit about JavaScript. So if that sounds interesting, feel free to join. If you have any questions or suggestions or maybe articles I have missed, feel free to throw them right now into the chat. If not, then we can basically wrap this up here and go have some nice weekends. So what do you guys have any questions or not? If not, then um, yeah, I guess I guess that's basically it. So some of you guys have been asking for a stream covering Swell 3. 
I am gonna do this next week. I'm still thinking of what kind of app should I build with it because you know the core, like there's two core things as well does really well. The first one is deriving uh, values from the uh, initial, like okay, creating derivative values, right? This is the one thing, and the other thing is working with observables, which is super cool. And I'm still trying to come up with a convincing enough use case. Let's put it this way for a stream, but. Uh, I hope I will do this before the Wednesday or maybe we'll just change up the day because I'm not sure how my schedule will look. But we're definitely going to have a Swell 3 stream next week. And uh, yeah, seems like no questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have a nice weekend or awesome rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.